You know what? It happens to us in so many different aspects of our lives. In our jobs, for example. We go through the motions in many ways. We go through parts of our jobs over and over and over again for one, two, three, 20, 40 years. Over and over again. At one time, the job was quite exciting and happy and brought us life. But time has gone by and the inner enthusiasm isn't just quite there anymore. Jobs can become stale. You know, you personally, but not just the job, can become stale on the job. We become washed out, worn out, burned out. We all know that feeling. You know, the same thing can happen to our young people at school and even us as adults who are still going through school and getting a higher degree. You know, inside, when you are going through the motions at school, you young people, when maybe your enthusiasm just isn't there anymore like it was at the beginning of the school year. I see some head shaking there going on. You know, those feelings, especially maybe when it gets time for spring break, or in the early, late May, early June, when you've been around that same teacher professor for six to nine months and you just don't think you can take it anymore. Amen. And those inner motivations just don't seem to be there anymore like they were in the beginning of that school year or semester. And you know, the same thing can happen in your religious life. And your relationship with the Lord. Where you just go through the motions with God again and again and again. You come on Sunday mornings for worship. Or on Wednesday evenings for Bible study. And you experience the same old routines and the same old prayers and the same old liturgies. And you sing the same old hymns that you've known for many, many years. And you sit in the same pew that you sit in every Sunday or for all your life. And you hear the, the sermons and the old pastor's messages he gives. And you just sit there and you sit there and you sit there just going through the motions every single Sunday. And so there comes a time in your religious life where you continue to go through those motions, but in there, in the inner motivation, that's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And your inner heart is not alive as it used to be. So in his relationship with God, Nicodemus was a man who was going through the motions, I believe. He knew the law. He was a teacher of the law. But his inner enthusiasm for God wasn't there anymore. So Jesus of Nazareth showed up in his town and Nicodemus had gone to hear Jesus preach in the temple. But Nicodemus says that Jesus had something inside of him that Nicodemus no longer had. Nicodemus was touched by Jesus. And Jesus is preaching and decided to talk to Jesus. So quietly, one night, Nicodemus went over to Jesus. Do we get much information about whether he was at home or where he was? Not a whole lot, but we see that Nicodemus went over there. I'm assuming Jesus was in a home somewhere and Jesus, Nicodemus came to Jesus and maybe knocked on the door. Knock, knock, knock. And Jesus came to the door and said, yes. But when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he did know enough to know that Jesus was offering some kind of new body repair. The temple priests and traditions had for good Jews been a place to seek repair work. Now Jesus' language implied that there was a new fix, a new kind of repair needed for the faithful. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night to check it out for himself. Nicodemus comes to Jesus secretly at night. 
and begins a little private conversation with Jesus. Nicodemus represented a rigid kind of thinking about laws and traditions and rituals, but also about the basic work of God. And Jesus wonders how Nicodemus could be such a trusted teacher and not know the inner workings of God's Spirit. And not know the power of God's Spirit and what God's Spirit can do. Nicodemus and the Pharisees had such clarity about the things of God. An entry of new ideas or expressions was too much to grasp for them. They seemed unable to bear the weight of the perceived consequences that might come from acceptance of such thinking about the Holy One. But what Nicodemus had such a hard time understanding was the concept that God did not want a detailed inventory of every dent, scrape, and scratch on the hearts and lives of the faithful. God already knew them. What God wants is to remake each and every one of them and us. Because God knows every scratch and dent and scrape on our lives. The things that we, you know, have deep inside of us that we don't think that God loves us because of those things. But yet Nicodemus just comes to him just the way that he was. And you know, God doesn't demand a story behind each fender bender. You know, God doesn't pick and choose whose sins are forgiven and which ones mean the most to him. God gives us new birth with water and spirit and remakes in us a new creation for us to be a new creation. For the old has gone and a new life is hope to come. And it's through this new birth that our relationship with God through Christ takes us on a deeper and more complete meaning as the experiences of our lives are seen through the lens of God's gracious and forgiving work of love. You know, we cannot go back and redo so many of our difficult trials and adversaries in our lives we can't go back and do something that we wish we would have done in another way. And, you know, we can't go back and take something back once it's already out. It's out. We are filled with guilt and regret and longing. And we often want to hold tight to those feelings, even when God is ready to take them away, giving us a fresh start and a new paint job. Yes, yes. But Christ's sacrifice, yes, Christ's sacrifice yes, would ultimately remake the way in which we live our lives. And our lives are given a meaning of purpose when we know and truly understand what the crucifixion on the cross meant and what it was about. And when we can truly understand and know what the resurrection means that we can be created <coughs> anew in Christ. You know, significantly, the late night conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, the Pharisee begins to wrap up with these famous words in our text this morning, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Did it say that God only, you know, forgives and accepts those who are black skinned? Did it say that God only accepts and forgives those who are a different, you know, nationality and creed than we are? No, it says that everyone, everyone who believes, everyone who believes in him will have everlasting life. That he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to what? To save it. You know, in our society, we think that just because we are a different so-and-so, or we're a different so-and-so say, that we don't belong to Christ, and Christ doesn't love them. What is up with our world today, brothers and sisters, that we exclude people just because of this and because of that? I believe it's pretty clear in our scripture this morning. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son for everyone. Not just you and me and because you attend church here every Sunday. Uh-uh. But for everyone that believes in him. And you know, the same God that offered the people of Israel the beautiful laws of the prophets that the Pharisees so dutifully helped and upheld are also offered through the gifts of love and the love that Christ has for everyone. Eugene Peterson, who translated the Message Bible, and his translation of this scripture this morning, verse 17, he translates this way. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help and to put the world right again. So it's time that maybe we stop pointing our fingers at one another. For like they say, you know, you, you can point one finger at somebody, you're going to have like 20,000 point back at that you. For how can we see somebody else's faults when we can't see the ones in our own lives? <laughs> For God so loved the world. So if God so loved the world, what is our commitment? Commitment individually or as a church to serve in his name. So for God so loved the world, what can I do for him? For God so loved the world, well, what does that mean? For God so loved the world, that. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. What does that mean? Maybe it means that I can see this text in a different way. Maybe I can hear these words newly like I've never heard them before. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. He sent his only son to die on a cross, right? Not just for those right there in that group because they are perfect people. Uh, and not for those people back there in that group because, you know, man, oh man, they are, mm, they have lots of sins they need to be forgiven of. But, you know, oh, those people are different than I am. And they, their skin looks a little bit different as well. But God so loved the world that he sent his son so that everyone, everyone believes in him. Have eternal life. So what are you going to do in response to that? God so loved the world. 